So next up is Harry Keller. He is also from Berlin. He is a front-end developer, even though he's not wearing a checkered shirt. Um, I, I found it interesting how Frank made it look very easy to do digital typography. How, how long did it take to develop a wiki, like a couple of days or a year? Oh, a year. Oh, not full time. So, Harry, he's got bad news for us. He says, digital is still tricky. So, I'm looking forward to what he's got to say about, I assume, a similar subject. Thank you, Harry. All right. That's pretty loud. Are we there? Yeah, yeah, now we are. Okay, uh, I'm a developer. No, we're not there. Um, as, yeah, okay. As a developer, I'm obviously used to failing technology, so this is sort of the story of my life. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been also quite a journey to get here. That was quite difficult. Um, the, uh, first I got sick, uh, then my flight got cancelled, then uh, the talk was announced as only 15 minutes. Um, and I thought, okay, do I have to cut it? Do I have to build another one? Um, but I'm here, I'm honored. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, the, it's, it's maybe a bit uh, intuitive why I'm here as a web developer. I'm not a typographer, I'm not a designer, um, but I do work with uh, designers every single day. And I should probably plug in the clicker. Too many things to do. Um, so, um, to understand why I'm here, we got to take a trip down the memory lane and look at 1995. Um, in 1995, uh, that was 21 years ago, we can all feel old for a, little, for, for a second now. Uh, Braveheart was in cinemas and the first Toy Story movie. Uh, Gangster's Paradise was on the charts. Um, we <laughs> We uh, watched VHS and there was really no internet in the households. And it was Christmas Eve um, that I got this. And um, this is an LC2. Uh, does anyone remember this machine? Yes. A whole lot of people. Crazy. Yeah, this was my first computer. Um, my parents bought me a Mac and told me this is a professional's device, this is really great, this is much better than the crappy Windows machines that all your friends have, and I believe that, and I mean, at that, at that time, that was probably true as well. Um, but for the younger ones in the audience, back then, on the Mac, there was pretty much no software for like regular, casual users. Um, it was all these pro applications. And um, so I was happy, though, and I played around with this. Um, and I only found out years later, uh, I think only five years ago, why my parents actually bought me a computer. It wasn't to invest in my education and give me professional applications and stuff. No, it was because they didn't want me to play video games. And, <laughs> and um, so while my friends were busy playing Resident Evil, uh, I was playing Photoshop 1.0. Um, <laughs> and Quark Express and MacDraw Pro and all of these things and um, made little, like, little newspapers and uh, like fake advertisements and sort of became sort of a graphic designer, although I didn't even know that job existed, um, just because for the heck of it. And um, then that sort of the skill set lay dormant for a while, but then I picked it up again when I was uh, studying computer science and media and started to build websites and really got into programming. Um, I worked uh, for four years at Eden Spiekermann, where I helped to build the digital team in Berlin, and also at Elf Freunde, which is a, a football magazine, um, which probably some know. I have not the slightest interest in football, but um, the people were really nice. Um, and we, we built the website there. Um, I then I went on to work at a smaller agency called the Colorbright, 
and uh, also um, then afterwards in the beginning of 2016 I founded my own agency which is this one um, it's called Dies das Digital um, the, the German uh, audience will understand that this is a slightly ironic um, but it is uh, we are a digital agency we do the usual stuff like concept and design and development and all of these things at once and together and don't want to separate these disciplines too much. So yes, I'm a developer and I studied that, but I've also worked with designers all the time and um, I'm maybe a part of me is also a designer. Um, we were lucky and worked with these companies, uh, sort of classic logo wall agency slide, um, and worked with uh, these companies over the course of this year. Um, you might see some familiar faces like the font shop and typemates and monotype and uh, there's something else type related. I don't know. Um, and so I've, I've worked on a lot of typography related projects. Also, when I was still at Aiden Spiekermann, we built uh, the Zeit magazine. Um, and uh, I worked on uh, online magazine for Red Bull. And um, whenever I approached these projects, um, I realized that digital type is still tricky and it's still difficult to get right. And I'm, I'm a web developer, like I said, I deal with type every day. You could say I'm the modern typesetter. I make, I put stuff on the screen. And I'm also, like uh, Frank showed, I'm also responsible for a lot of typographic decisions that you can't sort of in, uh, see in, in the static design that a designer builds. And um, type is the foundation of every interface. Um, and so I feel um, that this role that I have, sort of translating the static design that a designer makes into the living, breathing environment that the web then is, um, is, a pretty, is a pretty important one, sort of, in the line of making typography work. When we're talking about the web, I'm, I'm a web developer, we're talking about the browser and what the browser's capabilities are for digital typography. We look at a very fragmented environment. We have different operating systems, we have different browsers, different screen sizes, different connection speeds, different uh, feature sets, and all of this is pretty tricky um, to work with. Uh, so when native developers complain, oh, there's a new iPhone size, then yeah, okay, we, we've been there already. Um, so this talk is basically a, a rundown, sort of a rant, maybe, it might evolve there, we'll see, um, about all the stuff that is still difficult in digital typography on the web. And you would think that by now, after years and decades of CSS, some of the stuff would have been solved already. Um, but you might say, what is this dude complaining about? Um, we, we have fantastic technology, like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not only complaining, like stuff has evolved in the, in the past years, obviously. We have retina screens now and we can display open type features in the browser and don't photograph this because I wanted to put variable fonts, but I got confused by the name of this conference. And we have web fonts and we have all of these amazing things to render type more appropriately on a screen. And it's super crisp and it has all the ligatures and all the swashes and fancy like uh, stuff. And we, we have different font formats that work in different browsers. All of this is great, but it's about displaying type. And um, what Frank made pretty clear, I think, is that typography is about much more. Typography is about how you use the type and what you pair with it, different typefaces, how you utilize them. And um, in that regard, we are mm, not so far ahead. Um, but before we get into negative things, let's quickly talk about uh, the good stuff, like open type features. Open type features work really well across browsers by now. It's a bit tricky, like ligatures are fairly widespread, but then when we get into finer details, like swashes and stuff, it's, it's not so great, but it's the, the good thing about this is it degrades really well. If, if these features don't work, you can still read the text, that's good. And there might be performance implications, like w it was already mentioned, um, Marco Armand, the uh, developer of Instapaper, wrote a good article about this, that when you enable open type features for your whole text on your whole website, then stuff might be slow. Um, but you can pretty safely put it on headlines. Um, so the amount of code required to do this is fairly small, and you live a happy life adding this to your websites. This is all good. This works fairly well. The other thing that works really well 
is uh, sizing stuff relative to the font size. Um, this is something that I would have expected to be much more tricky, but browsers have done this for ages. We're obviously talking about the M unit, where you can say, here's a big headline, put margin below it or spacing around it based on its size. So when you change the font size, then the spacing the margin gets smaller as well. This is fantastic because you can build pretty, pretty uh, impressive things with it, like an icon next to the type that scales with its size, and you only have to adjust the font size when you're making an element and the icon is going to scale down. Um, this uh, is the M unit. It's super versatile. It's fantastic. It's still, after 15 years of using it, it, it still feels like magic to me that this just works because in technology and when you're a developer, nothing ever just works. But this is great. Um, it, you have to wrap your head around it at first, but that only takes two days and then you're fine and you can sort of scale text. That's good. Another thing that you very rarely see on web design is multi-column text, where you have uh, sort of the text flowing um, through different columns. Um, although it's super, super well supported, it's, it's really easy to do in CSS. Um, there are some browser quirks when you try to do uh, more complicated things, like putting images in the columns. You sh probably shouldn't do that. I spent once, I spent three days trying to fix it, and then we just abandoned it. Um, it's very rarely used because it sort of collides a bit with the scrolling of the page, so people don't want to scroll down to read the first column and then scroll up and read the second column, and then so it doesn't really work uh, for a browser that is an endless page, um, potentially. But y y one could use it on like small intro text and stuff. So um, it's very little code. It's, you're super happy using this because if you do it simply, there aren't any problems. All right, so this is good. Like, what am I complaining about? Like, we we have a pretty solid base, it seems. Um, but and and you might looking at this and looking at all the beautiful websites that you visit every day, you might think, okay, um, we've ushered into this era of beautiful web typography, and it's all fantastic and it's great. But no. Um, as somebody who builds these experiences every day, there are so many things that you constantly run into a wall and want to smash your head into the keyboard. Um, and it's, it's always the same stuff. So I'm going to take you through a website now, sort of from the top to the bottom, and we're going to look at a couple of things that are annoying. Um, because I, I don't do this to complain about the browser vendors or to s say someone didn't do a good job or something. I do this because I feel like recognizing that we have a problem and that all the hacks we use to make typography work on the web, um, recognizing that this is not how things are properly done, I think is the first step to actually improving it. All right, so you arrive at a website um, and you're lucky if you can see any fonts at all. Um, we've all seen this picture when we're in the subway or underground and your connection is weak and you can only see like the underlines of links and you see the button outlines and maybe an image has already loaded and you can select text so it's already there but the browser is intentionally hiding it from you. I find this infuriating. I once installed a content blocker to block all web fonts all together and it was blissful. It was the single biggest enhancement you can make to your web browsing experience to just get rid of all the web fonts. Um, obviously, that's not what we, what we want to do, but um, it really helps to mitigate this. Um, why does this happen? The browser, most browsers hide, uh, by default, hide text when the web font has not loaded yet. Um, Chrome is improving. Um, Chrome is adding a three second delay, so when the web font hasn't loaded after three seconds, it's just going to display all the type, all the content in a fallback font. Um, but for example, mobile Safari that we, like most of us or some of us, uh, have on their iPhones, just waits forever. And that is incredibly infuriating. Um, this is obviously meant to sort of disguise that there is a fallback font. Um, because designers hate this. Designers hate when the content pops up in Arial and then a split second later, um, you suddenly have your beautiful, ty uh, beautiful typeface that you chose. Um, but I would argue that it is a much better user experience to just show the fallback font and then um, display the web font when it's there, or if it takes too long, then just forget about it and display it on the next page. Um, part of the problem is that this is 
Well, this is a bit misleading. It's not hard to test. It's very easy to test with limited bandwidth. Um, you can sort of, when you're a developer, you can throttle the bandwidth on your computer and just test in low quality connection scenarios. But um, very rarely people do this because in like the conditions that we usually live in, like in a fancy office and with uh, fast smartphones, it's sort of, you got to get stuff done, and if you then throttle the bandwidth and test under 3G, then a whole new world of problems uh, reveals itself, and so sometimes you're lazy and you just don't do that. It's wrong, though. Um, you can fix this. Um, there are smart people who uh, looked at this stuff, but it is a lot of code to maintain, and it is also the kind of thing, and that is a theme in this talk, well, you think the browser should just do a better job. Why do I need to hack this? It's just about displaying a web phones, and we've had them for a while. But okay, let's assume that the type has loaded. Um, we are looking at a beautiful header. There's an image because every website looks the same these days. There's a beautiful image, and there's text on top, and the text is large. And then maybe you visit the same website on the phone, and the text like it has scaled down to the phone. And uh, this is beautiful, but the browser can't do this. And that is one of the other annoying things, that um, scaling text fluidly across different viewports um, is something that, is, that also requires extra work, like, um, which sort of boggles my mind. Like, it should be possible to say, here's a container, here's some text, put it in there, make it as big as possible, and be done with it. I know there are sli the situation is slightly more difficult, but there are JavaScript libraries that make this work. One is fit text, and um, it, it just feels like this should be easier. Um, now somebody who is also a developer in the audience might argue, but wait, Harry, there's the viewport unit. It does that. Um, yes, true, it can do something like that, but you've got to know what the content is. So if you're working with a CMS and you don't know if you're getting one word with three letters or a like long sentence, then um, you can't really f program any, any scaling algorithm into your CSS before. So one of the other things uh, that is actually really hard. Um, okay, so we scroll below the header, there's a headline, and uh, we're looking at this. Um, you would never ever set a headline in a book like this. You would always do it like this, because it's much more beautiful when it's balanced. And this is another thing, why can't the browser just display a headline? It's not that difficult. And then designers come in and say, okay, because you bash the developers, I gotta bash the designers now, I'm sorry. Um, so designers come in and say, yeah, let's just put a line break there. You know, it, we force the line break. Um, we do it in the CMS. But that doesn't work because your content is potentially viewed on a phone that is tiny or even on a watch or on a, on a giant screen. And the line break that coincidentally was just chopping off the last word here is going to be in different places on different screens. So um, you really can't do this um, manually. Um, there are, again, there are JavaScript solutions. Medium does something like this, which is really beautiful. Um, but there really is no browser support at all. And if you're using JavaScript for this, um, then things start getting really fragile. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's the thing where I don't want to add more stuff. Okay, so we've looked at the, at the line break. We've ha added another hack to do this. Um, now we're actually looking at the headline and we see, okay, on bigger, when the type size gets bigger, it's actually not visually aligned with the text anymore. Um, this is also, this is really annoying. Once you see this, you see it everywhere. And um, th the reason for this is obviously that the letters have some safe space around them. And when you scale it up, the space increases as well. And the headline appears indented, but while it actually is not, the, the browser is just doing a sort of lame job of rendering the, that type. Um, you can mitigate this again. You can sort of nudge the headline to the left and say, okay, I'm going to visually align this. But then you run into a problem that different letters need different amounts of nudging. So while an L has a pretty clear line where you would align it, 
um, a capital A, for example, doesn't really have that. You would sort of, because the visual center of a capital A is further to the, to the middle, so you would need to kind of bump it to the left more. And then you're running into a problem again, you can't really fix this easily. Um, yeah, no, not uh, all letters are the same. The browser should just be able to do this. The browser should just, if the browser was a sophisticated engine to render text, then something like this should be corrected. Okay, so we get to the content. We have a drop cap. Um, drop caps are nice, right? So elaborate and sophisticated. Um, everybody wants them. You see them on every single magazine that is on the web. Um, Th but they never work, they never look nice, because in a real drop cap, you sort of align the baseline of the drop cap with one line of the text. And that is something that the browser just can't do um, in the way that you position this. And then you get problems with screen readers, and there's ex ex accessibility issues with these. And um, if you take one thing away from this, look at the drop caps in all the magazines that you read online and you realize they're all horrible. Like sometimes this works, but then you look at it in Firefox and it's broken and you fix it in Firefox and you look at Chrome, it's broken, then you fix it there, you look, go back to Firefox, it's slightly off. It's sort of, you can never get this right. Um, again, there's hacks to do it, but it's one of the things that one should maybe rather stay away from. Um, indented paragraphs is an interesting thing. Um, ever wondered why all the books have indented paragraphs to separate them and all, it, all websites have sort of empty lines to separate them? Yeah, it's because an empty line is a consistent pattern that is much easier to implement. Um, when you add an a, like a empty line to paragraphs, you can just say, okay, add this to every paragraph and you're done. With indented paragraphs, you run into these problems that the first paragraph should not be indented. And when there's a subheadline and there's a paragraph starting below, then that one should also not be indented. And then you have an image floating here on a bigger desktop screen, and you scale it down to mobile, and the image sort of goes in between, and then suddenly on mobile, this shouldn't be indented anymore either. And the situation of building indented paragraphs is just... You can do it, it needs a lot of work, um, but you end up with this amount of code that nobody understands in, um, anymore after half a year, and um, then you add something else and it breaks and it's just not fun. I've, I've done it, but it is also one of these things where shouldn't you be able to tell the browser, hey, on this amount of text, here's a container, indent the paragraphs, be done with it. Like this is maybe something that machine learning can fix, I don't know. Um, but the rules are really not that complicated. There are just many exceptions. Um, mixing typefaces is interesting. Like, we, you should think at least that should work, right? Added, like, displaying different typefaces together. But as we all know, typefaces can appear bigger or smaller, even though they're the same size. So on a website that I recently built, we had Atlas Grotesque, which renders really large, and then we had Novel next to it, which renders really small, and then you run into this situation where both of them are the same type size, but one just appears a tiny bit smaller. And if you care about the details, then this is something that annoys you and that you would like to fix. And I looked into it, there is a, a, a sort of proposal in Chrome to add a font scaling um, a parameter in CSS that you could tell this typeface, hey, I know you're 8% smaller visually, please bump it up internally, but I don't want to worry about it when I assign type, type sizes. Um, but none of this is out there to, to use in any browsers that we all use today. Um, so you gotta fix this by hand, or you just don't care. But if, you, like, if we have an extreme example, like the one that I explained, um, then you have to do something about it, and you start adding all of these exceptions to your CSS again, and here, when there is something in there, then please make the font size two pixels bigger, and it's just, why doesn't this work? Hyphenation is fun. Um, hyphenation, uh, the browser support is okay in theory. Chrome, for some reason, doesn't do any hyphenation, but um, other browsers do. And in my experience, this should be the thing that you should be able to enable, and in Chrome, Chrome doesn't understand, okay, fine, Chrome doesn't do it, but at least in Firefox and in sort of Edge, 
uh, an Internet Explorer, even I think um, people get a better reading experience because text is hyphenated. Um, the reality is that once you enable this, you run into lots of weird side effects on obscure devices where words are suddenly chopped off in the middle and it's, it's just the kind of thing you turn on in the beginning of the project and you think, yeah, that's fine, um, this looks great. And then uh, after a while into the development, you realize, okay, the reports are coming in, that stuff didn't work and mm, okay, let's just switch it off. I mean, it's 2016, we can't hyphenate text in a browser. Um, and then obviously, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of code. There is a, uh, there is a library um, called hyphena hyphenation JS, but it loads a whole dictionary that is several megabytes to sort of get, uh, understand where to break text. And then it's different for different languages. So if you're dealing with a multi-language setup, it's also more difficult. And it just feels like if, shouldn't the operating system come with this? Um, yeah. So these are technical challenges. Um, then obviously uh, there's also the humans who mess up typography. Um, I didn't focus on this part. Uh, I think Frank did a good job already. People add, different, add the wrong uh, quotation marks, the wrong apostrophes, don't use like the ellipses, but type three dots. All of this can also be fixed, um, but it's sort of again adding more things to your code that shouldn't be there in the first place, maybe. Um, so I'm, I decided to compile this list of stuff because I feel um, we looked at all of this fancy technology today, like we have variable fonts and color fonts, and all of this is fascinating, but maybe there's some work left to be do to get the basics right first. Um, if we can't even do a drop cap and if we can't even do indent the text easily, then yes, we can tackle different things, but maybe somebody should work on this as well. And um, I don't really know why this is the case. I haven't that, like dug into this that much. Um, it might be the case that developers in general, not in this audience, but in general, don't care that much about typography, but also that's sort of insulting to the people who, who make these browsers. Um, so I'm, it's just a, it's just a, a, a hunch. Um, but maybe we need to be better advocates as a typographic community to get this stuff implemented so we can use it reliably on, on, on websites. Um, obviously, the stuff that I talked about, because we only have 30 minutes, is very sh much shaped by a Latin uh, perspective. I have no idea if drop caps and stuff make sense in Arabic, probably not. Um, but also in Arabic, there might be other typographic things, and the state is probably much worse than for Latin, that could also make their way into a browser natively and would improve the experience of both the people reading the text and also the developers and designers making the medium that the text lives on. Um, so, yeah, maybe we need to get more typographic thinking into the browser creation process. All right. Um, I think I have about 10 minutes left. I didn't want to end on, on this sad phase, uh, and now we're all frustrated, and it's like, okay, we were excited about variable fonts, but now I've, I've Harry kind of dragged us down into the abyss of uh, web development. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I, have, I have sort of another talk that uh, I'm going to put into in the, in the next 10 minutes, um, because we worked on a typographic project um, in this year, which was building a website for a type foundry. Um, and we thought, okay, this is going to be fun. This is going to be an opportunity to do it all right, to think about all of these typographic details and sort of build, craft an, a good typographic experience on the web. And then when we started building this, we realized, okay, that we have completely other problems, like drop caps are not even, not even on the list. It's, there's so much other stuff to fix. But... Um, We'll get into that. Um, it all started in November 2015 when uh, I and my colleagues were founding this company and we were sort of looking for a brand and we stumbled upon Sira. And Sira is this typeface um, 
as some of you are maybe familiar with, it's a geometric typeface. Um, it sort of has a modern feel, but it's not too technical. It's also sort of, it has a human touch. And we really liked it, and we bought this, and we based all of the stuff that we put out as a company on this typeface. And then in February, four months later, we get a call, um, and there's somebody on... Uh, on the other side of the of the phone and says hello um, you probably don't know us but we're the, we're the guys who made your typeface and this was one of these delightful moments where I said, oh we can thank somebody for for the because we were super happy with it and um, some of you may know them um, the, the <laughs> Jakob, <laughs> sorry, um, Jakob Runge and Niels Thompson, um, and they came to us and said, hey, we would um, like to work with you, we feel that it could be a good match, and let's, let's build our new website for, for our type foundry type mates together, and also add an online shop, because if we're doing it anyways, then we're going to do it properly, right? Um, and so we started doing that, and we thought, like, one of the people that, uh, that I found this with had experience with shopware, because his dad runs uh, a shop selling olive oil. And uh, so we thought, okay, yeah, sure, we got this. Um, <laughs> we can do that. How, how difficult can it be? Um, admittedly, we had experience with type like shops for typefaces before. I very briefly worked on a new font shop website and um, on uh, the font font website back in the day. Um, but we thought, okay, we'll give Shopware a try, uh, and then uh, we quickly realized, no, this is not going to work, because type licensing is pretty complex, as we all know. And there's different license types, and there's, then there's volume discounts added to it, and then when you mix different typefaces, then there's also supposed to be a discount, and then you have to scale it up sort of by the users and by the workstations, and it's all incredibly complicated, and Shopware just didn't... Maybe you can make it work, but we didn't have uh, enough experience with it. So what we ultimately settled on was Craft. Um, it's a lesser known CMS here, I think, but it's a really nice approach. It's not like WordPress where you get everything and then your work is basically stripping everything out that you don't need. It's more modular and gives you a set of building blocks to make websites and also shops. And you can sort of build exactly what you want. Um, we also looked at Oscar and Snipcart and also Shopify, but we felt, okay, Craft and Commerce is probably the way to go. Um, the team setup was interesting because uh, Jakob is sitting here in Munich and Niels was in Hamburg and we were sitting in Berlin and then there was some poor dude from, from the craft developers who I always, uh, at his time, at midnight, sort of bothered about tax calculation and he was really getting annoyed but he also implemented at least 20 features into craft that we needed for the shop, so that was great. Um, we, all the communication was in Slack and we actually only met those two guys once, which was a typo when we had a beer, but we never saw them at, like another time. Um, sort of how you start one of these projects is always the same. Like you look at the designs, like they had done some stuff, there was a, like a rough sitemap, and we did some prototypes and we thought, okay, this is all gonna be good. Let's collect some requirements in Trello, like you know Trello where you can make these little cards in, in lists. And uh, we started putting them in there, and it was all looking good, and then uh, until it didn't look good anymore. Um, <laughs> this happened, and then at some point I was sitting there and trying to make this work, and then there was all the licensing stuff that needed to be implemented, and then there was the security uh, concerns, because obviously we're storing user data, and then there were supposed to be all of these interactive type testers, and they were supposed to be responsive, but if you load all the web fonts on some overview page, there's 16 megabytes, and then there's Trusted Shops, which is a company that tells you what is legally wrong with your shop. And they gave all the, like, no, you can't display prices like this. And then there's a tax calculation with European VAT IDs that need to be validated. And then there's tons of design revisions. And just let's put it like this, it was fun. 
Like this was a fun process. This was pretty messed up. Like there was, there was also a mess at points, but it was fun because it was really, really challenging. And what we ended up building is sort of this base system that serves a blog and some custom work and typefaces and uh, has an about section and an in use gallery, like the usual stuff that you would find on a, on a, uh, on a website for a type foundry. And we built this plugin that sort of collects all the font data. Um, where Niels and Jacob upload all of the fonts that they want to sell and as the, as the source files and then we're subsetting them or Jacob is subsetting them, I think, to, to use them wherever we don't need to be interactive. We serve sort of a smaller font file. And then there is a checkout process, like you put stuff in your cart and you select the license and um, then you pay. And then there's all of this stuff happening, like Trusted Shops said a lot about that and then there's a tax calculation and the licensing calculation and the discounts that apply and then uh, in the end when you finish the checkout process you we build a plugin that sort of goes to the font library and collects all of the font files and sticks them into a zip and adds a license PDF and adds a sample CSS and all of the usual stuff that you would expect and then you can download this font archive um, this this is just for some out there, like if there's some people running a type foundry and thinking to build a website, this is probably what you need. Or you do it with Shopify. That's also possible, but then you have other problems. Um, it ha hasn't launched yet. It was supposed to launch yesterday morning, but we thought, okay, if I'm on, the, on a train the whole day and you know the Wi-Fi at, in Deutsche Bahn, um, then maybe it's not the best idea to launch at 9 a.m. in the morning and then you, we can't fix anything if something's wrong. Um, but we, we can sort of give you a little demo. Um, a lot of stuff is not fixed in there yet. When we postpone the launch, we decide, okay, we have a bit more time. Um, but you can sort of play around with the typefaces already on the homepage and there's, uh, there's some uh, in-use images that you can browse and add link to the typefaces. And there is obviously a blog. Um, that lists all of the um, all of the in use articles that they have with photos and all of the case studies and all of the making offs and um, that yeah this one is only images but uh, that happens there 's also some that have more text um, there 's an about section obviously as you would expect and uh, then there is the font collection where you can browse all the typefaces. There aren't so many yet, that's why they're all in one list, but we're probably adding then like tiles and stuff. And this is really, all of this is really like the super basic version of this to just get it out as soon as possible. We know that there's stuff wrong, that like some of the margins aren't, aren't quite there yet. We don't have drop caps yet. Um, and uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but um, also we don't want to keep it sort of in development any longer, but we want to iterate on this with the feedback that we get from people. So we decided to sort of push it out um, rather sooner than later. And you can play around with the typefaces like this, and there's more images, and then at some point you get to the buy, scroll faster, you get, uh, oh yeah, you can look at some of the open type features and the language support and these things, and uh, then you get to the buy panel, and there's some gray in there, but as we saw earlier, um, the, that's not visible here, or we didn't see earlier, <laughs> rather. Um, but yeah, you can add stuff to the card, you can sort of check out and buy these typefaces. And um, I'm, I'm, like a lot of, thinking in this uh, in this project also went into the licensing of these typefaces. Um, we could convince them or we could reach the decision together to just sell desktop and web fonts always at the same time. So you can't buy a desktop font only, you always get the web font with it and vice versa because we feel that is uh, just um, the appropriate way to do this in this environment that moves fluidly between desktop stuff and web stuff for most clients. All right, um, this goes on for a while, but I think it's coming sometime next week. You can check it out. It's uh, typemates.com, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. Harry. My uh, pleasure. Any, any questions? 
Actually, I have a question. Yeah, sure. You you showed the that it's still quite tricky to to do proper hyphenation on websites. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Is it a, a good solution to insert um, soft hyphens in, in the raw text? Uh, yeah, I, I researched it this morning, actually. <laughs> um, uh, let, me, let me think if I can remember. Yeah, soft hyphens make sense, but most of the time, like when you control the content, but most of the time you can't really expect editors who are just filling in in the CMS um, to add soft hyphens because that would mean they would m know that this problem even will come up. Um, it's, uh, yeah, when you're building a marketing website that has a couple of headlines and you sort of know what it is, then that's a good solution um, until there's proper support for it. Um, but I feel for the, like the bigger part of the web, this is not so much an option. So, so it couldn't easily be automated on, on the server side? I'm thinking same mm -hmm. thing as the JavaScript, but without loading two megabytes dictionary into the browser instead uh -huh. of doing it on, on, the, on, the, on the server. That, that's an interesting idea. I'm sure that people have thought about this before, and I'm sure that there are libraries that do this. Um, but that would also mean if you're, building, if you're building your work on a CMS that has a fixed feature set, then you would need some way to shove it in there and connect it to that. I don't know if there's word, a WordPress plugin to do this kind of stuff, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's still more work. Like by suggesting that you're proving the point that I was making. <laughs> yeah, but sure. I mean, it's a stopgap, maybe. Any more questions? Um, yeah, normally I also like the M unit. Yeah. It's really a good thing, but sometimes wouldn't it be cool to have millimeters as well to define the exact size of a button on a device, for example? Also, I really miss it sometimes, yeah. but there's no chance to get it, I think. It's funny that you bring it up because CSS has these units. It has a millimeter unit and it has a centimeter unit. Um, interestingly, nobody uses them. You're right. Um, I, I all... Hmm? Okay, how do they work? Oh, okay. Yeah, the problem All right, is that so there's um, your answer why you can't do this. But I think you're pointing out an, an important thing. A lot of the times you don't want to use pixels or something. You want to define a size for an element. And if that is displayed on a smaller screen or on a bigger screen, sometimes doesn't make that much of a difference. So um, going back to these physical units might be of value at some in some times. So Maybe true. the problem is that the browser, it should know the DPI or the pixel per inch of the display and it doesn't know them. It usually does know that because okay. there are also media queries for that, but they don't know the exact? Okay. Okay. Then there's something that should be, would be an enhancement. Please do. Yeah. Uh, and I started a thread there on this very specific topic. Uh, so if you're interested in it, Yeah. Good. Oops. Anyone else? Otherwise, I'm going to close this slowly. you got sort of 10 seconds left. Do you want to go for a cake as well, or do you? Yeah, yeah it's yeah, a cake yeah. break now, it's right? It's cake time. Yeah, I think everyone's <laughs> excited for that. All right, enjoy your cake. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.